Okay, so um, a lot of this is review of Net Plus stuff, which you hopefully know. Um, we're going to talk about the, the game here is uh, redirecting traffic. So first you talk about how traffic flows normally, and then we start talking about the various attacks that move traffic to where it shouldn't go. And there are quite a few of them. Um, so your, all your traffic has to go at layer one. Some physical medium has to move the data from point one, one point to another. In the early days of Ethernet, everybody used hubs because they were cheap. So the data was sent to every device on your local area network, and each device would then ignore all the packets that were not addressed to it. And this continues because Wi-Fi does the same thing from the laws of physics. There is no way to prevent the wireless from going everywhere. So it does, in fact, go to everything within range, whether it's on your network or not. And that's why when you look at the wireless networks, you see all these wireless networks, which are not the network I'm on. And in a coffee house, I'll see 50 or 60 of these. So I'm getting traffic from all these networks that is not mine. And my network card knows which network I'm on and only lets that traffic into my machine, but all those people are inadvertently sending their packets to a bunch of computers that are not the one they really meant to send it to, and all those computers are politely ignoring traffic with another address on it, unless they decide not to, by going to promiscuous mode. So that's the game Ethernet NICs were designed for this situation. So the first thing that happens when a frame comes into your network card is it looks at the checksum to see if the frame was damaged in transit, and the checksum is a CRC32, which is not hard to forge. So the only alterations they're going to catch are accidental alterations. If you want to maliciously forge a frame, you can do it. And I haven't heard of that one, but I have heard of some layer one injection attacks. But anyway, um, if it passes that test, it then looks to see if the MAC address on the frame matches the MAC address on your NIC. And if it doesn't, it discards it. And if it does match, then it passes it up to higher levels of processing. But if you switch your card into promiscuous mode, it skips that step and just passes everything up so you can look at packets that were not addressed to you. They still have to physically enter your card, though. And if you're on wired Ethernet and connected to switches, then nothing will come to you except broadcasts and things addressed to you unless you do something to hack the network. So that's the game. The first six bytes of the frame are placed there for that reason, so that the NIC can just read the first six bytes, and if they don't match, it doesn't have to read anything further, and that saves it time and bother. Um, and that's the game. And under normal conditions, that's what you do. In promiscuous mode, you just don't bother with that test, so every packet is passed up for higher levels for analysis. And we have a project in the 123 class where you detect promiscuous NICs this way because you can just send packets to the right IP address and the wrong MAC address, and a device in promiscuous mode will answer them because it'll get them, and a device not in promiscuous mode will not get them. So it's quite easy using any kind of packet crafting tool like Scapey to detect this. On wireless LANs, if you have no encryption on a wireless network, then everybody's just spraying unencrypted data everywhere, and anybody in range can pick it up just like a hub. Uh, WEP was intended to prevent this, but it uses the same key for every packet. So anybody that can join the network can now see all the data. WPA generates a different key for each person. And I know at this college, we do something very strange. We publish the WPA key, which is the same all the time, free wireless for all. That's not a secret. And they'll say, why do we even use WPA2? And my network administrator told me, we do it to protect students from each other. And it, so that one student can't read another student's traffic. And that is false. WPA2 does not provide that security, which I was surprised when I found that out. And I put it in the last class as a, uh, a project. Um, if you look at WPA2, the problem is you, the, the real, this is, this is why I've had a student one time ask me, what if I put the secret into username and publish the password? And I say, you know, if you were the only person on earth, that might work. But the problem is you're going to interact with other systems. And this is just like you could wire up electrical equipment that has the, the black on the hot and the green, uh, what, the black on the hot and the red on the ground. And if you only have one device, it'll be fine. But as soon as you interact with stuff other people have wired up, everything's going to blow up. And so the problem is we tried to do it backwards at this college, where we hand out the WPA2 key, and then we imagine students are protected from each other. And there's a reason why the key is the only secret. Because inside the network, if you have the key and you can join the network, then the individual keys for each device are just created from that WPA2 passphrase and your MAC address which is not a secret, and they're negotiated with this EA Paul packet. So if you can catch these four EA Paul packets, which are sent through the network, you can find out anybody else's key and you can read their traffic. It's 
seriously rude. So it is true that you provide some privacy in that people have to know a little bit more to snoop on their neighbor, but they're not really prevented from snooping on their neighbor in this kind of network. So that's pretty unfortunate. Anyway, and you, in the last class we did this, all you have to do is, if you know the key, like Coherer here, then, uh, and if Wireshark can catch the four keyframes sent over EA Paul, then it is an extended authentication protocol, then it can get somebody else's key and totally read their packets. So it was not designed to make you private from other people on the same WPA2 network. What you're supposed to do is 8021X, where every person has a separate network key, and then they can't snoop on each other. But that's not how we're using it here, and it doesn't work to do what we're doing here not very well. Anyway, I've got a few cahoots about this stuff. All right. All right, I guess I've got everybody I'm going to get. So four questions. So what address delivers frames on a LAN? MAC address, good. What device sends every frame to the whole LAN? All right, that's the hub. All right, what address routes packets on a WAN? That's IP address. And what device here sends every frame to the whole LAN? All right, Wi Fi, of course, goes everywhere. All right. So here's my winners. Let me just make a note, since I haven't got any paper and vent. And Kaji EC. All right. Let me just save this as temp somewhere. Good. So let's carry on here and then get to the demos. Uh, all right. So Wireshark has some fun modes. You got promiscuous mode if you want it. This is the default for Wireshark, where you see every packet that comes in, which is fine. Um, and you have monitor mode. Monitor mode depends on your hardware, but Macs can do it. So let's play with this because at first it looks pretty weird. So let me bring up my Wireshark. Let's see if I can get this thing out of my way. I wish there was somebody to get rid of the black part, and I think there might be. It vanishes when I don't pay attention, but I don't know how to make it vanish deliberately. Anyway, such is life. Um, here's Wireshark. And... If I do capture options, there are two fun modes. This is monitor mode, what it's in right now. If I get rid of that, it goes back to normal mode. So this is the way you've normally seen Wireshark. And what it's going to do is show you traffic as if it were Ethernet. Now, the thing is, Wi-Fi is not Ethernet. Wi-Fi is actually much more complicated than Ethernet. But once you have gone through a lot of negotiation to join a channel and pass in the Wi-Fi key and all that, then it moves data in packets that look a lot like Ethernet packets. So in this mode, Wireshark will try to make it look like Ethernet by throwing away all the radio frequency part of it. And so you'll see things like ARP and UDP and ping and stuff are familiar protocols here that you would see on a wired network, which is fine, but it's lying to you. If you want to see what really happened, you go and into monitor mode. And monitor mode just lets you see everything that comes in the wireless card in its raw form. And now most of it is just going to be protocol 80211. And you're going to see, here's what really happens. If you want to talk on a wire, wireless network, you have to send a clear to send 
and a request to send saying everybody else has to shut up. I have something to say. Did you all shut up? Okay, now I'm going to say it. Now tell me if you got it. Okay, now other people can talk. It's like that, so it's fantastically inefficient. Large numbers of frames are lost. The total bandwidth is shared by everybody in a very inefficient way, and on it goes. And you'll now see those frames. And one of the things you see here is the quality of service data flying around. And you see acknowledgments, and you'll see beacons. Should be a lot of them. I shouldn't have to hunt too far for them. Here are beacons. Well, if I get, I could actually sort or filter if I have to. And if there's enough junk going on this network, maybe I'll have to. There's a beacon frame there. These beacon frames are what causes that list of wireless networks up there. This is the, um, there's your beacon frame. And if you look at it, it's got, uh, it's sent to broadcast and it's got data in there. And if I can ever get these silly things out of my way. All right, I should have parameters here. And someplace in here is the name of the network. And there it is, Bracky. Uh, but I think the SSID, here's the SSID parameter set, CCSF guest, there you go. That's the beacon frame. And these things go out at something like 10 per second all the time. You can turn them off, but if you do, you follow up roaming on a when, not this, because if you want to carry your laptop from one room to another on campus while you're downloading a file, it has to know when to let go of this access point and connect to the next one. And it does that by the beacon frames. It watches this one get weaker and weaker, and this one gets stronger and stronger. And when this one gets stronger, it lets go of that one and goes to this one. And that's how the evil twin attack works. All you have to do is boot up your laptop, emit beacon frames, be more powerful than the real access point, and all the wireless devices in the room will silently let go of the real access point and go to yours. And most operating systems, and I've never heard of any fix of this in 10 years, they will cheerfully go from a WPA2 protected network to an unencrypted network with the same name and not tell you anything and continue the same session. So you can just downgrade them to unencrypted traffic, steal their passwords, then turn off your NIC and they'll go back to the real one and continue their session. They will never know this has happened. So this is one of the many reasons why people say well, you shouldn't really trust Wi-Fi very much. You'd be a whole lot better with a hardwired network or with 3G connections or 4G connections, which really are private. You have your own line to the telephone network and it's got your own encryption key that's not being shared with other people. Um, so I was, if I was going to have a high security company, I would give people laptops that did not have wireless cards and they make them use the phone every time they want to connect. You'd be a lot safer. A little more expensive though. Anyway, so uh, that's sniffing and monitor mode where you can see the 802.11 management frames like clear to send and beacon and all that jazz that are flying around all the time and are normally thrown away by Wireshark. Uh, you can then filter your Wireshark. So if you put in DNS, you'll see things that are DNS protocol, which is fine. You can also look for words in any plain text with frame contains text. And you can follow a stream, which we've done quite a bit of. Uh, this is often what you want to do. You follow a stream and it takes just the layer seven data and throws away all the addresses. So you can see, for example, an HTTP request with all the cookies and everything in the HTTP reply here. And here's a 301 move permanently, which we are going to see is very evil. Um, you can also export objects from Wireshark. It will put them together. It will put together JavaScript and images like ping that are moved through HTTP or FTP and anything else that's not encrypted. It'll reassemble it for you. It'll reassemble voice phone calls so you can just play them out the speakers. It's really got a whole lot of cool things built in Wireshark. Um, there are other things, uh, other tools just to uh, steal data off networks, but most of them are inferior to Wireshark. The only thing about Wireshark is Wireshark is like, say, Firefox, where everybody keeps adding extensions and they're not very well vetted, so Wireshark is unsafe. And if you try to run it as root, which is what you must do to capture live data, it will warn you, don't run Wireshark as root. Then if you run it and you're not as root, it won't let you sniff on Ethernet. So you feel like it's wasting your time. But the point is, uh, as we're going to go through a net network security monitoring class, the, the recommended procedure is to capture data with command line tools like dump cap, and then analyze stored captured data with Wireshark. That is the secure way to do it. If you run Wireshark on live data, your machine can easily be taken over because all these individual protocol filters are just written by sort of amateurs and contributed to the club. And so therefore there are protocols that have made mistakes and allow vulnerabilities through. And so they don't recommend using it for routine monitoring. And in fact, it is also so sloppy that if you just turn on Wireshark and let it go, it will fill up all the RAM in your machine and make it crash. 
because it's really not designed to be a live data collection tool. You can do it, but it's primarily designed to be a static data analysis tool. Anyway, yeah. What was the command line? Um, dump cap is the one that comes with Wireshark. TCP dump is the one you'll find in Linux. There's also one called T shark, which is the command line. There's quite a few. Yeah, those are good ones that are used. Anyway, so our cache poisoning is a big part of a lot of attacks. The trick here is to redirect traffic on a local area network to put you in the middle. So what you do, you've done it in the last class, you can send false ARP replies that change the association between IP addresses and MAC addresses in the cache of a Windows machine or a Linux machine. Um, ARPs are one of the most common kinds of network packets on any network. You're sending them all the time because these caches have a short lifetime of something like two minutes and everybody keeps forgetting where the default gateway is and asking again because in case somebody changed the router, they're not willing to use old addresses for the router. So you can poison the cache in end devices and as far as I know, no one has ever even proposed any solution to this. The packets are unauthenticated, unencrypted, trivial to forge um, and no one seems to care. In general, this is like the IPv6 router advertisement attack that you saw in the last class uh, the general opinion of the security community is that you shouldn't bother securing layer two. It's hopeless. Just try to keep people off your layer two network. I am not very convinced by this logic because wireless networks don't limit your layer two very well at all. And shared hosting doesn't limit your layer two at all. If you rent a server, either physical or virtual at a server farm, you can just run some of these layer two scans. And when I did it, um, I found that there were 178 other customers on my layer two subnet. So I could have taken down any of them, redirected any of their traffic to put me in the middle, uh, and they just don't care. And the hosting providers say, we provide bandwidth and power, and you plug you into a switch, and security's your problem. But there's nothing you can do to stop layer two attacks, really. Firewall doesn't do anything. Anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting issue, but they aren't all that common, because you can't attack someone remotely over the internet. You have to get close to them first and that is considered to ameliorate the risk in most cases. Anyway, if you want to attack someone from a distance, you have to mess with DNS. Um, so DNS cache poisoning, you can do it at the client level. If the uh, machine is Windows, it has a DNS cache. Linux does not. So um, you can also poison the servers with attacks like Dan Kaminsky's attack, and so it puts out the wrong address. You can also use social engineering and attack the registrars and cause people to change the association between a domain name and an IP address at the root of it all, and all these are quite often done. So after you have somehow tricked someone into getting the wrong IP address for domain name now, they send traffic to the wrong place and you can put up a phishing page or whatever you want to do. Um, DNSSEC will stop some of these attacks, like the poisoning of servers, and if you actually maybe in 10 years, you reach a point where DNSSEC is so common that we actually enforce DNSSEC in the browser, then it would stop it in the client too. Then you would actually have an authenticated signed piece of data telling you what the right IP address is, and it couldn't come from somebody else. But that is years off. Um, right now, DNSSEC is in its early deployment, like IPv6 was five or six years ago, to where you can't really rely on it because most people aren't using it. And a lot of people that have turned it on have not implemented it correctly. So if you were to block everything that fails a DNSSEC test, most of the internet would just go dark. And that's not acceptable. So that poisoning the server, um, you could easily, for example, uh, the Kaminsky attack, if the servers are still vulnerable, which they mostly are not, you could just make one Comcast customer view a page. And as a result of them viewing that page, they could poison one of the Comcast DNS servers. And all the other Comcast customers that use that same server would have their traffic redirected. And we do that in the DNS security class, but it is not that common anymore because this was patched mostly in 2008 when it came out, and only a few people are still going to be running vulnerable servers. It was a pretty clever attack, though. It made Dan Kaminsky very famous. And then there's SSL Strip from Moxie Marlin Spike, who's probably the world's leader in cryptography in many ways. Um, and you use this in the last class, too. It is fantastic. So what you do is the target's trying to go to, say, Facebook, but you put, a pro you put yourself in the middle with, say, art poisoning or any other technique, and then if they try to go to Facebook, 
this, this guy makes an HTTPS connection to Facebook and then serves it to you over HTTP. So it looks good in your browser. You can log in, you can use it, but your traffic is actually not encrypted at all. Facebook has no way to know this has happened. How do they know this is not the real customer? You have no way to know this has happened unless you're smart enough to know that Facebook ought to be HTTPS. And so uh, one defense is Chrome. Chrome has memorized for you what the top 1,000 sites are, whether they should be secure or not. So Chrome will not let you make an insecure connection to something that ought to be secure like Facebook. Uh, there's also HSTS headers, where if you do connect to the real Facebook, your browser will store information about what certificate should be used. So if you later connect and there's a different certificate in use, it ought to warn you that something looks wrong here. Um, and as we're going to see, Firefox has even implemented a solution in the last couple months. Because I didn't see it when I tested this stuff in May, but I saw it now. So let's play some games with this, because a lot more people are vulnerable than they think they are. So let me start with the project from the last class, which I updated today, and then I'll show you how to find more of these, and you'll see the big names that are vulnerable. But I'm, it's less, it, now I think it's probably mostly going to be an issue for cell phones. So um, if you use Bing, Bing was my target for years. If, so let's, let's set this up. If I take, uh, I'm going to have, in this network, I found, here's a password being stolen from a Bank of America site, we'll do that later. So this is running um, SSL strip, and here it's showing me the data that SSL strip logs. So let me go to the other window, let's see, this one here, okay. Now the City College network has Meraki access points, and when I tried to do this in bridged mode while connected to our network, it said Meraki blocks proxy servers, which was pretty interesting. So I couldn't do the attack live when in bridged mode, so I went to NAT mode, so I'm on a private network separated from City College, and that means I can't attack my host. I can only attack other virtual machines. So I'm going to run... Um, uh, come on, shift control N. All right. So if I do ifconfig here, I've now got a private address, 172.16.1.188, and I'm going to attack this Windows machine over here. All right. There's a Windows 10 machine. And... It's actually a domain member, but I logged in locally, um, and yes, there we are, glorious Windows 10. So I put Firefox on here. It's generally the one that gives you the most simple connection for networking, and it lets you show off vulnerability to attacks because they don't implement so many defenses as Chrome. And Firefox, by default, browser is set. All right, now Firefox is going to update which today, they updated Firefox to hide the proxy settings, which irritated me for a little while. Um, I got halfway through the day doing this, and then when I tried to continue, the buttons were gone. <laughs> it's kind of annoying. And then, halfway through the day, SlideShare removed the re-upload option. I'm like, dude, so my slides are, up, are out of date. <laughs> it's just, but you, until you get used to this automatic update stuff, you think you're losing your mind. Anyway, so now, if you go into Options, there's no longer an advanced tab down here where there used to be. I have no idea where they hid the proxy settings, but there's a search engine. So I can search for it here, and I find it. So there's the proxy settings. I don't. That's going to be my new flow. Mm -hmm. So now it's set to go to the right place, go to my other virtual machine on port 8080. So data is passing through that. So if I go to some insecure site like mine here, then Oops, that's spelled wrong. So that's just going to give me some kind of error message. There. Okay, this is one of my vulnerable pages loaded over HTTP. So let me get to my... Here's the other window. And there is the cache. Make this bigger and get down to the bottom. Okay, let's run it again. Tail. All right. I'm not going to search your password. Let's just see the whole log. All right. So there's information about the log of a kind of data that's been stolen. And this data right there is not very interesting, but I'm going to try and catch some more interesting data. So let me put these things so they fit more or less on the screen. And you can see this, the web pages over here and the stolen data over there from the man in the middle. So now if I go to Bing, this is what I used to do for several years. Bing was vulnerable until about the start of this year. So if you go to Bing, Bing is not encrypted which is why I use it for a lot of things. It's kind of amazing. Even searches are kind of private, but Bing is not encrypted. And not only that, it's got a login button in the corner for Outlook. 
Now here you're not seeing it, just because my window is too small, but if I make my window bigger, you'll see a login button up here. And if it irritates me enough, I'll just find it another way. All right, it's going to irritate me. Outlook.com, I think that's it. One of these will take me. Yeah, here we are. Now I can sign in. Notice I'm still not encrypted because I passed through H SSL strip, and SSL strip changes every HTTPS to HTTP on all the links and everything. And you'll continue until the server finally wises up, if it ever does. So I can sign in here, and here we go. I, Microsoft is still vulnerable. Here I am at a non-HTTPS login page. However, Firefox has now implemented defense, and this has happened only in the last month or two. This is not because it has a bad HTTPS certificate. This is because it's not HTTPS at all, and now Firefox puts this here. So it does warn you that for some unknown reason, someone is getting you to log in. So I guess it's looking for things like login or credit card number or something on the page and warning you that you're putting in something. So if you ignore that, which is asking a lot these days, then you'd put in your name and next, and then secret password, and somehow bypass that warning and sign in. And of course, it's stealing that data. But this is, to be fair, they really gave the user a lot of warning. So somewhere in this mess should be the secret password. Um, here's login format. You're in the, here it is, secret password over here on the right. Secret password, it's getting it. But I had some warnings. However, if you're using another browser, like Opera or something, you probably get you, and I bet, I want to try phones. I highly doubt that phone browsers warn you yet. Although maybe Firefox on a phone does. So anyway, um, phones are usually vulnerable a lot longer than anything else. But anyway, I wanted to show you some more tricks here. So, so the way I found the pages here, and I found a bunch of them like Salesforce and others that were vulnerable, um, and that's what students used in the previous class. So here's Barracuda Networks, they're vulnerable. Um, here's Constant Contact. And there's Apache, which is vulnerable. And there's um, ADP, which is vulnerable. Salesforce seems to have fixed it. Um, anyway, I actually even notified these people, but they don't care or understand it. And now I'm thinking it's probably not worth notifying them anymore because this warning is beginning to fix it another way. There's another layer of defense coming in. But anyway, it's worth mentioning that these guys are easy to find and it's fun. So let's take a look at vulnerable banks. See, if you want the simple kind of login page there, I used to I'd look for login and then in URL HTTP. So they want me to log in on an insecure page. This used to be universal at all banks about 10 years ago. They felt like people couldn't load an HTTPS page readily, so they would have an HTTP page with an HTTPS sign-in button. And that is vulnerable to this attack and many others. Because the primary page doesn't have any integrity control, so I can modify the primary page to change that button and you'll never know. But this one, I, I was just trying this earlier today, and it's good, clean fun. So if you go and search, let's find how many we can find. If I go to Google and I search for bank and then log in or sign up in URL, and now Google is getting pretty suspicious about this stuff. When I do these things, especially if you go to page after page of results, after about 10 pages, Google starts noticing this guy's obviously a hacker. There is no legitimate reason for someone to have a search like that, but so far all you have to do is this. <laughs> if they continue to irritate you, you have to use Tor or VPN or something. But anyway, here we are, Citizens Bank, Personal ID, U.S. Bank, Bank of America. Now, let's see, so let's, I started trying to pick on the Bank of America, I've been doing that for years. The Bank of America security officer even grabbed me at uh, B-Sides a couple years ago and said, you should quit picking on us. I said, well, are you going to fix that stuff? He said, no. And I said, well, then we got a problem. But anyway, uh, but, um, so here's a Bank of America login. So if you click on that, it's not secure. Well, gee, it sure looks secure. But this is secure.bankofamerica.com. But Google had it here. So what happened? If you want to know what happened, it's something a little bit subtle and unsafe. And here's what it is. To see what happens, you have to use Chrome Developer Tools. Um, so let's turn on Developer Tools. All right, and go to the Network tab. And let's watch what happens if we go to that thing that Google actually found, which was Credit Card Payment Wake Forest University. If you go there, what happens is you end up at a secure page. But the way you get there is you go to an insecure page, and then you have a 301 redirect. So that is not safe. And you can prove it. If I do that in Firefox, 
with my man in the middle attack running. I've closed Firefox, but I can bring it back, and it will hopefully remember the proxy settings it used to. Um, now I'm getting a bad feeling that it forgot the proxy settings. Let's take a look. Proxy? It did forget the proxy settings. How rude. Oh, that's right. I didn't, that's right. I have to use my virtual machine. Pardon me, I'm not attacking the real network. It's here. Okay, it didn't forget the proxy settings. Fine. All right, so this is the page where I can go to that Bank of America site. There, credit card payment, Forest University. And if I do it through SSL strip, SSL strip rewrites it all, and I end up back at the Bank of America login page without the HTTPS. So the fact that they went through an insecure forward is enough of a hole to get in. You have to go straight to HTTPS, like you type HTTPS in the browser, or you click a link that is really HTTPS. Then, you never try to make an insecure connection, and I never get a chance to grab you. But if you pass through an insecure step, then it doesn't matter, because I downgrade you to HTTP, and your browser, if it's not Chrome, is dumb enough to fall for it. So now I can go Bank of America, Bank of a customer, and here I'll have secret password, B of A, and looks like it's there. Yep, and it, it in fact logs in with a big blob of junk, but I was able to find it earlier today, so I bet I can find it again. Before all that garbage, there we are, there is secure.bankofamerica.com, and somewhere not far from that is the password. Firefox, there we are, secret password, B of A. So secure, I'm not so sure. But anyway, like I say, I think uh, this is being addressed. The, the companies have no clue. And even when you tell them they won't fix it, this is like too complicated for them to comprehend. But the people that make browsers are starting to wise up. And that may be the cure, is the browsers themselves will just warn you that you are dealing with a moron and want you to log in without encryption. Don't do business with these people, and that will shame them into fixing it, perhaps. Anyway, so that's the, uh, the joy of the SSL strip attack in the modern world. I think it's on the way out. Like web attacks, uh, I think in another few years, this will just be a historical curiosity and not a realistic way to steal things anymore. So uh, I'm down to the last cahoots. All right, I'll give it another few seconds here, see if any more are coming. Looks like that's it. Okay, four questions. Okay, what allows you to see beacon frames? That's monitor mode, not promiscuous mode. Promiscuous mode applies to wired networks as well. Monitor mode is what lets you see raw radio traffic. What process redirects traffic on a WAN? And that's DNS poisoning. That's the way to move things to the totally the wrong physical server. All right. If you type HTTPS in the address bar, what vulnerability have you still got? To steal your password, I should say. <coughs> All right. None of those will work, and that's why we better talk about it. SSL strip will not work if you do that. You don't make an insecure connection, which then turns secure. You make an immediate seven-way handshake to get a certificate from the server. So that's the point of this. If you actually use HTTPS, it is very good, and none of these attacks are going to get your password. All they will see is encrypted junk, and they won't have the key. The only people that can break in at HTTPS are people that do something like infect your machine with malware to steal the key presses before they're encrypted, 
or people who get root certificates by bribing certificate authorities, hacking into them, or being nation states that can put pressure on them and suck them out. Um, but it is pretty difficult. And so HTTPS is not a bad thing. It's not like it's broken and we can't use it. It's really pretty good. You can trust it for banking and other things on, as long as you don't make mistakes with it. But there are getting to be an awful lot of mistakes to make. Your server can downgrade to export grade encryption, for example, and then it's not secure. You can pass through a redirect, which as you can see, a lot of people do, and then it's not all that secure. But if you actually don't make those mistakes, it's pretty good. You're only going to be hacked into by the real military and big organized crime syndicates that can forge HTTPS certificates. Anyway, all right, which process redirects traffic on a LAN? And that's our poisoning, of course, puts you in the middle. But being in the middle doesn't really do you much good if the stuff is encrypted with a key you don't have. And that's why things like VPNs and HTTPS are really valuable. Because you can't secure ARP, but you can put another layer of security on it that will lower the damage. So Stan and Jeff and Cam again. On EC again. All right, good. So those are my winners. And I'm going to stop the Kahoot share, although if anybody wants to text me their real name, I'll wait up a few minutes. So, uh, all right, I'm just going to go to the lab and help people. If you won, you might want to tell me your name so I can give you your points.